Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. And welcome to the Making the Economic Case for Health Equity Tribal and State Solutions webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. And if you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star 0. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Friday, June 22, 2012. And I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Terry Klein. Please go ahead, sir. Great. Thank you very much. This is Terry Klein, and welcome to the webinar, Making the Economic Case for Health Equity, Tribal and State Solutions. We have a great lineup for you today. Um, I have the great fortune of moderating uh, the webinar. I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the state of Oklahoma, as well as the Commissioner of Health. Um, in the state of Oklahoma itself, we have uh, 38 federally recognized tribes, and very, very fortunate to have uh, great leadership and great partnerships between uh, state departments of health and the sovereign nations uh, that exist within the Oklahoma boundaries. Um, we have uh, many opportunities that are available through us, to us through these uh, partnerships and a lot of challenges. In the webinar today, uh, we'll hear uh, some specifics about some uh, research which has taken place as well as some of those partnerships and some of those relationships in uh, two different uh, locations. Most of us, when we think about health equity, we're thinking about health equity in terms of social justice, and uh, which are very near and, and dear to our hearts and, and very uh, visible to us. Uh, we also realize, and we'll highlight today, some of the uh, economic issues associated uh, with health equity. And uh, we need to find a, a common language. We need to make sure that people have ways to talk about the economic impact of health inequities uh, that are easy to understand. Uh, as we talk with different uh, target audiences, we may need a different language for those different groups. Uh, hopefully this webinar will help provide us with some of that language as well as highlighting some of the issues. We also know that there are uh, significant inequities and disparities that exist between different racial ethnic groups, uh, socioeconomic classes, geographical locations, and uh, differences in the, in the social determinants of health, such as poverty, education, inadequate housing and unsafe working conditions. A very concrete example, my office is on a health sciences center campus. We have the highest concentration of healthcare in the state of Oklahoma uh, in this one location, and yet in our surrounding area, we also have the worst health outcomes uh, in the entire state. So it really speaks to the complexity of these issues when we look at the uh, health inequities. Uh, the burden of health inequities constitutes a, a very large, a huge financial and social cost uh, to our nation. We know, and I think uh, Dr. Smedley uh, will address some of this, approximately $230 billion in direct medical care expenditures and more than $1 trillion uh, in indirect costs are associated with illness and premature death uh, for the years 2003 to 2006. Those dollars could have been saved by uh, eliminating health disparities for racial ethnic minority groups. Uh, we also know that economically segregated neighborhoods or more likely to have limited economic opportunities, unhealthy options for food and physical activity, and environmental hazards, substandard housing, uh, lower performing schools, and higher rates of crime and incarceration. The lineup today, we have uh, four individuals who will be presenting. Each will have a, a different perspective that they will bring to the webinar uh, related to health equity. First, we'll hear from a researcher with expertise in economic, making the economic case for health equity. Then we'll hear from uh, state-level leadership who have uh, boots-on-the-ground experience uh, who will be able to talk about the importance of tribal collaborations and, and state public health. I will introduce each of those individuals uh, prior to their segment of the presentation. And first, we will start with Dr. Brian Smedley. Uh, and he will set the stage and provide background context for our webcast. Then we'll have questions at the very end of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Smedley is the Vice President and Director of Health Policy Institute for the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies in Washington, D.C. Uh, he oversees all the operations of the Institute, which was started in 2002 with funding from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And the Institute has dual focus to explore disparities in health and to generate policy recommendations on longstanding health equity concerns. Formerly, Dr. Smedley was the research uh, director and co-founder 
of a communications research and policy organization, the Opportunity Agenda, where he led that organization's effort to center equity in state and national health reform discussions. Uh, he holds an undergraduate degree from Harvard University and a PhD in psychology from UCLA. And Dr. Smedley, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Klein. I want to thank ASTO for having me with this important webinar. Uh, you very nicely teed up this conversation, Dr. Klein, in that uh, there is an economic case to be made to address uh, health inequities. Uh, I'll briefly review the research that we have conducted uh, on that topic. And then I will uh, focus on local and state level strategies, particularly to address the uh, issue that you raised of uh, of segregation and the importance of place. Uh, we think that there are some important opportunities for tribal uh, governments, for state governments, and local governments to begin to address some of the issues associated with uh, the concentration of poverty uh, and to begin to uh, advance equity across a, a range of sectors. And I'll briefly uh, review some of the, the promising directions that we're looking at. Uh, could I uh, ask that the next slide be advanced, please? So first, talking about the economic burden of health inequalities in the United States, I'm going to refer specifically uh, to the report, The Economic Burden of Health Inequalities, that we at the Joint Center released in September of 2009. This can be accessed at our website at www.jointcenter.org. Uh, this uh, research was conducted by Dr. Thomas Leviste of the Johns Hopkins University, as well as Dr. Daryl Gaskin, uh, also of the Johns Hopkins uh, University. Uh, and we thank them for their important contributions uh, to this research. Uh, this was the, the first uh, research to our knowledge that attempted to uh, assess both the direct medical costs associated with health inequalities. In other words, what, uh, what are the, uh, the, the total uh, amount of dollars that uh, we as a nation are spending to address the higher burden of disease and disability uh, in communities of color? Uh, obviously, to the extent that uh, people of color have a higher burden of chronic disease and disability, uh, potentially there are higher costs associated uh, with these, uh, uh, these inequities. Uh, and so we attempted to quantify what those direct medical costs were. But of course, the economic burden is not limited to just the higher health care costs for those populations that have a higher burden of poor health. There are also indirect costs of health inequalities. So for example, if people are too sick to work, obviously we lose productivity in workplaces. And to the extent that people die prior to their uh, healthy, uh, productive working years are over, uh, then there are costs to the nation in the form of things like uh, lost tax revenue at state, local, and federal levels. So we attempted to quantify both these direct costs as well as these indirect costs. Next slide, please. First, in talking about the direct costs associated with health inequalities, uh, doctors Leviste and Gaskin accessed the Federal Medical Expenditure Panel Survey data, which are uh, compiled by the uh, Agency for uh, Healthcare Research and Quality to come up with these estimates. Uh, what they did was to look at the uh, burden of chronic disease, in other words, the uh, prevalence of chronic disease and, and the actual medical expenditures associated with diseases such as asthma, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, et cetera, uh, and looked at the uh, excess costs associated with direct medical care for African Americans, Asian Americans, and, and Latinos. Obviously, uh, to the extent that uh, it was possible, we attempted to try to include other population groups, such as American Indians, but uh, the, uh, d uh, the data do not allow for reliable uh, estimates for uh, smaller populations. What we found in that four-year period between 2003 and 2006 was that over 30% of the direct medical care costs uh, for African, Ameri African Americans, Asian Americans, and Latinos were excess costs due to the higher burden of chronic disease and disability across a range of disease areas. Uh, the total costs approached nearly $230 billion for these direct medical care expenditures in that four-year period. And if we were to add in those indirect expenses, such as lost wages and productivity, uh, lost tax revenue at local, state, and federal levels, uh, we estimate that the total combined cost uh, approached $1.24 trillion in that four-year period. So obviously, uh, this research suggests that our efforts to contain healthcare costs to 
to bend the, the healthcare cost curve, as, as some put it, uh, are impaired to the extent that we cannot uh, reduce the burden of disease among many populations that have a higher uh, burden of disease and disability. Uh, and uh, to the extent that these health inequities affect our productivity uh, and our state, federal, local budgets and, and tax revenue, uh, then clearly these have important implications for the uh, economy as a whole. Uh, what we suggest is that uh, the, in addition to the important moral imperative uh, that we as a nation uh, tackle the, uh, the, uh, the, the higher burden of, of poor health uh, for many populations of color uh, is that there's also an economic case uh, that we all pay a cost both in terms of direct medical expenses. In other words, uh, everyone who pays a, a, into a private health insurance premium or, or into public uh, uh, health insurance, obviously there, there's a cost that we all pay. But then to the extent that the nation is, is uh, still trying to, to come out of the economic downturn, that is also impaired by the higher burden of disease and disability for many populations of color. Next slide, please. I want to focus now on the uh, lens that we use in our work to advance health equity, and, and that is to focus on geography, th that is place. Uh, many scholars have noted that there is an important geography of opportunity in that the spaces and places where people live, work, and play powerfully shape not only their health but also their life opportunities. Uh, in general, a large body of research points to the fact that the places and spaces occupied by people of color tend to host a disproportionate cluster of health risks and have a relative lack of health-enhancing resources, and I'll say more about this shortly. Next slide, please. First, we need to understand the role of segregation. Uh, we, in our uh, work, uh, agree with scholars such as David Williams at the Harvard School of Public Health who argue that segregation is a root driver of many of the racial and ethnic health inequities that we see. Certainly as a nation, we've come a long way in terms of desegregating our communities. We no longer have Jim Crow laws on the books, uh, and there are ostensibly uh, no longer uh, uh, conditions that are tolerable from a legal perspective uh, to, uh, to reinforce uh, patterns of segregation. But segregation persists at high levels, particularly for African Americans, American Indians, uh, and many uh, Hispanic population groups. Uh, and so it is the, the, the problems associated with segregation for many of these communities of color uh, uh, are, are among the underlying risks for poor health that these populations face. Next slide, please. When we consider uh, the problem of segregation in the U.S., it's important uh, that we consider uh, how deeply segregated many of our uh, American cities and metropolitan areas are. Uh, many, many years after efforts to dismantle Jim Crow uh, and to uh, enforce fair housing laws. Uh, this slide presents data from Doug Massey and other demographers who's, who've looked at the level of segregation in the United States uh, in several major metropolitan areas relative to a country like South Africa, which in 1991, uh, of course, enforced state-sanctioned segregation through apartheid. Uh, the measure that these demographers are using is a measure called the dissimilarity index, which represents the percentage of a population that would need to move in order to create uh, complete segregation between two population groups. So in South Africa in 1991, while uh, apartheid was still in effect, uh, South Africa had a dissimilarity index of 90, meaning that 90% of white and black South Africans would have needed to move to create integration in the country at that time. Unfortunately, as late as 2010, many U.S. cities were not far behind the level of segregation found in South Africa. So in Detroit, uh, for example, the dissimilarity index is 85, meaning that 85% of white and black Detroiters would need to move to desegregate that city. Similarly, in Milwaukee, New York, Chicago, and Newark, we find dissimilarity indices of 80 or higher in each of these cities, meaning that four out of every five individuals, black and white, would need to move to create integration in these cities. Next slide, please. The issue of segregation is not that uh, people of color living together is problematic in and of itself. In fact, we have many uh, instances historically in this country where so-called ethnic enclaves or other instances of segregation uh, can actually uh, uh, prove to offer protective effects, for, particularly for new 
uh, new immigrants to this country. The problem with segregation is that it concentrates poverty. It tends to exclude and isolate communities of color from the mainstream resources needed for success. Uh, we know that African Americans, Latinos, and American Indians are more likely to reside in poorer neighborhoods regardless of their own income level. So we have many instances of middle and even upper middle income uh, people of color who are uh, more likely to live in communities with higher concentrations of poverty as a result of residential segregation. Segregation restricts socioeconomic opportunity by channeling people of color into neighborhoods with poorer public schools, fewer employment opportunities, and smaller returns on real estate. These are so-called opportunity structures. In other words, we know uh, that in communities with high concentrations of, of poverty, high levels of segregation, uh, that these schools tend, on average, to be under-resourced. They tend to have uh, crumbling physical infrastructure. They tend to have outdated textbooks, teachers who are not credentialed to teach in the subjects that they teach in, uh, fewer uh, uh, college uh, preparatory uh, courses, such as advanced placement courses. Uh, these are the kinds of schools that face high dropout rates and are less likely to prepare students for success uh, in higher education, which obviously has important uh, implications for socioeconomic mobility. These uh, kinds of neighborhoods have fewer employment opportunities, uh, less uh, capital for business investment, and very, very significantly, the issue of the value of real estate. Most American families, uh, uh, their wealth is, is tied to the value of their home or their property. Uh, for people of color living in communities characterized by high levels of segregation, on average, we know that their homes, even when they are comparable uh, to homes in majority white communities, that these homes are going to have uh, smaller uh, returns over time. They, they appreciate uh, in value at a lower level uh, than homes in majority white communities, again, even for comparable properties. And when we consider the, home, the recent home foreclosure crisis, which of course is an ongoing crisis, uh, it's important that we recognize uh, that the, this crisis has been one of the major drivers of the growing wealth gap uh, between white and non-white communities. Uh, for example, 10 years ago, uh, we know that the wealth gap between blacks and whites was about 10 to 1. That is, for every dollar of white wealth, African Americans had about 10 cents. For every dollar of white wealth, Latinos had about 11 cents. Today, that gap is much wider as a result of the disproportionate burden of the home foreclosure crisis in communities of color. So today, for every dollar of white wealth, African Americans have about a nickel. Uh, for every dollar of white wealth, Latinos have about six cents. And of course, given the important relationship between socioeconomic status and health, uh, these are among the major drivers, the major structural inequities that contribute to poorer health among populations of color relative to whites. And arguably, uh, these kinds of factors are the, uh, the major factors uh, that contribute to the, to the very vast and growing uh, gap in wealth and socioeconomic opportunity between whites and non-whites. Next slide, please. We know that there are other problems associated with segregation. We know that people of color are less likely to live in communities with supermarkets or grocery stores selling uh, healthy products such as fresh fruits and vegetables. In contrast, uh, many of these uh, families are more likely to live in communities that are literally overrun uh, with vendors selling things that are harmful for people, such as fast food outlets, liquor stores, convenience stores, carryout stores. There's also disproportionate tobacco and liquor advertising in many of these communities. These neighborhoods also have fewer parks and green spaces, uh, fewer safe places for walking, biking, uh, exercise, and recreation. The point here uh, is that we have spent uh, quite a bit of, of time and resources in this country trying to educate people about the importance of, leaving, of, of living a healthy lifestyle, eating uh, a healthy diet, exercising. Of course, these things are important, but they're often difficult to do in highly segregated communities characterized by high levels uh, of, of poverty uh, because these neighborhoods tend uh, not to reinforce or even to present opportunities uh, for people to enjoy a healthy lifestyle. Next slide, please. We know that many of these communities are more likely to be exposed to environmental health hazards. We know, for example, from the important research of the United Church of Christ, uh, that disproportionately uh, neighborhoods with uh, sources of environmental degradation, such as hazardous uh, waste facilities, uh, are more likely to house people of color uh, than whites. Uh, and disproportionately, people of color are exposed to sources of air, water, and soil pollution uh, in their neighborhoods relative to majority white neighborhoods. 
And then there's the poverty tax. People in uh, poorer communities have to pay more for the same goods and services than those in higher income communities. So on average, you pay more for auto loans, auto insurance, furniture, appliances, bank fees, that is, if you can find a bank. In many of these communities, you cannot find a bank branch, and so as a result, uh, people are unbanked. And in order to cash a paycheck, you have to go to a payday cashing outlet, which takes out a significant chunk uh, of that pay, uh, paycheck in order to provide cash. Next slide, please. Just as an example of the depth of poverty concentration that we see in many metro areas, uh, I'm, I'm going to present some examples of two different metro areas where children of color are disproportionately in uh, neighborhoods with high poverty concentration. And I don't mean to pick on cities uh, such as uh, Cleveland and the other city that I'm going to provide an example of, uh, but they are representative of many, many major metropolitan areas uh, where we see children of color disproportionately in uh, neighborhoods with high, high uh, poverty concentration. Uh, these are data from the website diversitydata.org, which I highly recommend to anyone uh, interested in demographic trends such as racial and ethnic uh, trends and poverty concentration. Uh, what we see here is that children in Metro Cleveland uh, live in dramatically different neighborhoods based upon their race or ethnicity. As you can see from this slide, the set of bars on the far left shows children who live in neighborhoods with between 0 and 20 percent poverty concentration. These are neighborhoods that are, on average, healthier uh, for people to live in. They have better uh, uh, retail food environments. They tend uh, to have better quality housing, uh, less environmental degradation, uh, better public transportation, etc. Over 90 percent of white and Asian American children children in Metro Cleveland live in these neighborhoods with low poverty concentration, a little over half of Latino kids and a little over 40 percent of African American kids in Metro Cleveland live in these neighborhoods. In contrast, black and Latino kids are disproportionately concentrated in neighborhoods with between 20 and 40 percent poverty concentration. As you can see, over 40 percent of African American and nearly 40 percent of Latino kids in Metro Cleveland live in these neighborhoods. In contrast, relatively few white or Asian Asian American kids live in these neighborhoods. And at the most extreme end, neighborhoods with poverty concentrations over 40 percent, we can see again that a, a disproportionate share of black and Latino kids live in these neighborhoods, which are literally toxic for the health and human development of these kids. Now you might argue uh, that these uh, uh, findings are not surprising given wealth and uh, education and income differences between uh, people of color. Uh, and whites. But as the next slide shows, even when we control for differences uh, in the uh, family income, uh, we still see dramatic differences. So this slide shows the poverty concentration of, of neighborhoods of poor children only. That is, black, Latino, white, and Asian American kids who are living below the poverty level. So among poor white kids, over 70% of poor white children in Metro Cleveland live in neighborhoods with a very low poverty concentration, between 0 and 20%. About two-thirds of poor Asian American kids live in these neighborhoods, but relatively few poor black and Latino kids live in these neighborhoods, only about one, one in five. Uh, poor uh, black kids live in these uh, neighborhoods, and about 28% of poor Latino kids live in these neighborhoods. Again, however, uh, when we look at uh, neighborhoods with higher poverty concentration, disproportionately, this, these are the neighborhoods where we find uh, poor black and Latino children. So the, as these data show, the experience of poverty can be very different based upon a child's race or ethnicity. Let, next slide, please. Next slide shows Metro Detroit. Again, I'm not trying to pick on Detroit or Cleveland. Detroit, in fact, is, is my hometown. Uh, but again, we see a very disturbing pattern where disproportionately uh, white children are in neighborhoods with very low levels of poverty concentration, whereas black and Latino kids are much more likely to be found in neighborhoods with very high levels of poverty concentration. And again, if we were to control for differences in family income by just looking at children below the poverty line, as the next slide shows, uh, again, we see that kids of color are far more likely to live in neighborhoods with a high level of poverty concentration uh, than white kids. Next slide, please. So just to briefly uh, 
uh, highlight some key policy opportunities. Again, many of these opportunities exist at tribal, state, and local levels. So we can, for example, expand place-based opportunity by reducing residential segregation. Uh, we can, uh, for example, uh, harness uh, the many housing mobility programs such as portable rent vouchers and tenant-based assistance to ensure that people who seek uh, housing uh, vouchers uh, can move to communities with lower levels of poverty concentration. We can also vigorously enforce existing anti-discrimination laws in home lending, rental markets, and real estate transactions. And we can encourage greater commercial business and housing development in communities that have suffered from disinvestment. We also need to expand public transportation to connect people in, in job-rich areas uh, to, uh, in job poor areas to, to communities with high levels of job growth. This is often critically important because in many metro areas, uh, areas with high job growth are not in uh, urban uh, inner cities, but are in suburban and exurban communities. We've got to expand our public transportation to ensure that people who need jobs can get to these communities. Next slide, please. We can also improve uh, education. Education from a public health standpoint, of course, is critically important uh, to close equity gaps. Uh, one of the most important opportunities is to expand high-quality preschool programs. There's now abundant evidence uh, that high-quality uh, early childhood enrichment programs can effectively inoculate children from the effects of living in high-poverty neighborhoods uh, because they have long-lasting effects through adulthood. We know this from the many uh, very successful longitudinal studies such as the Perry Preschool Project and the ABC Darien Project uh, that have followed children uh, for, uh, using a, uh, a randomly uh, assigned experimental design of following children into adulthood, showing that those children that were in early uh, enrichment programs have better outcomes as adults in terms of their education, their career and, and employment opportunities, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. We can also invest more in uh, creating healthier communities, uh, doing things like uh, improving conditions in the environment, reducing environmental degradation through a more uh, aggressive regulation, and enforcement of laws and, and uh, the use of tools such as consolidated environmental review, which allows uh, policymakers to consider the, the cumulative effects of many different sources of environmental degradation on health and human development. We can also structure land use and zoning policies to reduce the concentration of health risks. For example, limiting uh, the siting of fast food stores and other vendors selling unhealthy uh, uh, products and creating incentives for vendors such as grocery stores or farmers markets to open in so-called food deserts. And instituting policies such as health impact assessments to determine the public health consequences of, of uh, policies and practices across a range of sectors, including housing, transportation, education, and other uh, policies. Next slide, please. There's a very important experiment going on uh, on housing mobility, the Federal uh, Moving to Opportunity Experiment conducted by the Department of Housing and, and, and Urban Development. Uh, it's being implemented in five cities. Uh, this study is now uh, following families some 15 years after uh, providing uh, housing assistance to help uh, people move out of distressed communities and into neighborhoods with lower levels of poverty concentration. What we're finding is that when these families uh, are away from concentrated poverty, they've tended to fare better in terms of their physical and mental health. Adolescents uh, report less risky behavior, such as risky sexual behavior. Uh, and we know from a recent study published in the New, uh, New England Journal uh, that some of these families have, re have reported lower levels of obesity and diabetes subsequent to moving to neighborhoods with better opportunity structures. Next slide, please. I just want to conclude with a quote from the World Health Organization Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. Uh, they wrote in their uh, report of 2008 that inequities in health and avoidable health inequalities arise because of the circumstances in which people grow, live, work, and age, and the systems put in place to deal with illness. The conditions in which people live and die are in turn shaped by political, social, and economic forces. In other words, the health inequalities that we see are not naturally occurring. They are the result of policies and practices that we have put into place, and sometimes uh, market forces, which unintentionally uh, have hurt uh, the health and development 
uh, of those living in neighborhoods with high levels of poverty concentration. And we can undo these conditions through smart policies, smart growth uh, that allows us to consider health and equity in all policy decisions. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion to follow. Great. Dr. Smedley, thank you very much for those uh, sobering statistics and research, and really speaks to the magnitude of the challenge uh, to improve uh, health equity across our country and also uh, giving us some ideas about how we might uh, eliminate those health inequality uh, areas uh, that are so prevalent. Uh, next, we have two presenters who will share with us a uh, state and tribal perspectives. I will provide you with both of their introductions because they'll be presenting together. Uh, Anna Whiting Sorrell is the director of the Montana Department of Health and has been since 2008. She's responsible for overall department policy development, management, and coordination of programs. She previously served four years as Governor Schweitzer's policy advisor on families. Uh, she spent her professional career working for the Com Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, where she's an enrolled member. Uh, she also worked in tribal administration, uh, overseeing a number of programs, including the tribe's efforts in self-governance and other legislative efforts. Uh, she's developed and implemented a nationally recognized substance abuse prevention and treatment program, and uh, she's a graduate of the University of Montana with a BA in political science and a master's in public administration. Joining her in this segment of the presentation will be Jane Smiley, uh, who has worked for the state of Montana for more than 30 years. Uh, she served as the administrator of the Public Health and Safety Division at the Department of Public Health and Human Services since 2004 and has provided leadership to a variety of public health efforts through the years, including public health system improvement, accreditation, public health emergency preparedness, tobacco use prevention, and chronic disease prevention and control. Uh, she holds a master's degree in public health from the University of Washington. And Anna and Jane, uh, the floor is yours. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Klein. Um, this is Anna whiting Sorrell, and I'm going to start with a brief overview and, um, and then Jane is going to actually walk you through some of our efforts in, in working specifically with tribes. So can everybody, uh, I, mean, I, I hope I'm being heard. It's a, kind of an odd, uh, uh, odd format for me here. I, um, Sounds good I, to hear. I have to say that, you know, I do a lot of talking across uh, the state and the country. Uh, Montana has seven reservations and, and very large reservations. Um, and we have one state recognized tribe and and so with the governor's appointment um, of me into this position um, really the first uh, Native American to ever be appointed to run a health office um, in the country um, it, it has put a tremendous amount of responsibility I believe on myself I've put in that on to make this the absolute best opportunity to really look at how um, do, do states and tribes and Indian people interact in a public health system, in a health program? Uh, I also am fortunate enough to run the state Medicaid department um, and many, many other programs, so looking at that as an opportunity. Um, in preparing for this, I, I spent a significant amount of time actually uh, trying to understand the, the material that was presented and just now presented um, by our, our previous presenter and trying to make that relate to Indian country. Um, and, and I have to say that it was difficult for me. Um, and it wasn't until Dr. Klein just said, um, we really need to be aware of that there is different language that is spoken with different groups of people. And that clearly I came forward in the presentation as I read it, as I tried to do research on this topic, um, and um, as I listened to the presentation. Um, and, and I also really um, think it's important for us to take the last statement that was made about policies and practices um, of the research that's available out there. How do you put that in place in Indian country? Um, uh, you know, the best example that I have is that as a Native person, as an Indian woman, we don't usually refer to ourselves as people of color. We don't see ourselves in that mainstream language about, um, about people of color. We, we look at ourselves as being very distinct and unique um, in our ability uh, and, and what our goals and, and values and, and uh, what we believe is success in life. 
um, if if you take what was just taught, what we were just told about how important location is, um, and and how that really helps determine economic success, and if you don't have economic success, the impact on your health. Um, my comment would be, of course, Indians have a horrible health disparity then because we are a reservation-based system. And that reservation-based system is what we work hard to protect every day as sovereign nations within this country. Um, there isn't anything more important for Indian people than to protect their sovereignty and the treaty rights that got us to have this reservation-based system. Um, I, I would share a brief example about how important that is to, to, to Indian people. I've had the wonderful opportunity to work for Governor Schweitzer for about seven and a half years now. And um, I have driven 150,000 miles over that time so that I can go home every weekend to my reservation home. Um, I want to be there. I want to be practicing the culture and traditions that are retained in those reservation communities. So we're almost the exact opposite of wanting integration. We strive for segregation and the strength that we believe comes from being our tribal people. I, um, I, I also want to go back about land ownership. Um, you know, collectively, we, don't own, we own our land collectively, not individually. And so it's a whole other way of thinking about the language that we're using um, when we talk about Indian, Indian communities. Um, and, and so I think that, that become, those become really important um, predictors if those are the important predictors of poverty and health equity, then we have to really figure out a whole new language in which we build off of the research that we know that exists, but the reality of, of uh, what we find in our reservation and tribal communities. The last thing I would talk about is the, the, the reporting issues which we, when we were reading through, we didn't even get um, Native American uh, data in the report that was, um, well, that was put forward. And as I tried to go and do the research to see if I could come up with Indian uh, information, I realized that because we are so small of numbers, and certainly the last speaker spoke to this, it is hard to, to uh, get that information out. We're rural, we're a small number, and I would also contend that because so much of our health care comes from Indian Health Service, a terribly underfunded system that doesn't always connect to the larger system that our data is even more cumbersome to find. Um, and, and so I think that what we find today and have the wonderful opportunity, thank you, Ashto, for bringing this to light, the contradictions that we need to come together to understand if we're really going to understand health inequities, the economics around it for Indian country. The, um, the one thing that I think we have done here in Montana is to really take time to understand what government to government is. How do you engage tribal governments, tribal people into this um, solution? Because and ultimately that's what we want. We want to improve. And what we've come to understand in Montana is it's about building relationships, personal on the ground relationships in Indian country where we really can understand all of what I've just talked about. So Jane is going to take over, and she's got some wonderful examples um, that we're going to put forward. So, And then I'm certainly available for questions when that period comes up. Thanks, Anna. Um, and I think Anna touched on, but I also wanted to just reiterate, we sure don't have really the resources. We don't have economists to perform the kind of analysis specific to Montana that was just presented um, for the country in some major metropolitan areas. So I, I will tell you that what you will hear from me may sound sort of basic. I'm really talking about the burden of um, health disparities, but not in terms of dollars. Um, if you'll advance the slide, please. Thank you. Um, no surprise here, 
same sources of health and equity that were mentioned in the previous slide um, affect our Montana population, and American Indians are obviously way more affected in our state. Go ahead. Looking at um, some key social determinants of health inequities in Montana, um, clearly American Indian residents have much higher rates of unemployment and poverty. Go ahead. In terms of access to health care, we have a higher proportion of American Indians reporting no insurance, foregoing um, health care due to cost, and not having a usual health care provider. On average, uh, Montana American Indians die uh, 20 years earlier than our white residents. Four um, leading causes of death in Montana that you see here represent approximately half of all deaths, and American Indian residents die at a higher rate from each of them. Smoking is the primary and entirely preventable risk factor for heart disease, stroke, lung cancer, and 13 other cancers. It has um, adverse effects on, pro on pregnancy and on infants and children who are exposed to secondhand smoke. Obesity and lack of physical activity are major preventable risk factors for many chronic diseases. And as you can see in this slide, American Indians experience um, higher uh, prevalence of all of these uh, modifiable risk factors for chronic diseases. In terms of cancer incidence, um, uh, lung cancer and colorectal cancer, the rates are statistically significantly higher for American Indians. The breast cancer rates are not different for um, American Indian women. American Indian women um, are screened at about the same rate as white women for breast cancer. And you'll see, um, as I said in the last slide, our rates of breast cancer in that population are not different than among whites. However, American Indians participate in colorectal cancer screening at only about half the rate as whites. And as was shown in the last slide, have higher rates of colorectal cancer. So we see these as the critical interventions really for chronic disease, um, tobacco cessation, risk factor management, and cancer screening. And in terms of our outreach to American Indians and some of the work that we're doing, we do provide funding to every tribe and to two urban Indian centers for tobacco use prevention, including youth prevention. Um, policy work, especially to prevent exposure to secondhand smoke, and then um, promoting cessation through our state's tobacco quit line. Our cardiovascular health program works with tribes on community-specific education campaigns, and those are about the warning signs of heart attack and stroke and the importance of calling 911. I think Anna has presented on those campaigns previously, and I hope you had a chance to see some of the beautiful materials we've produced. In addition, we work with um, the tribes and with Indian Health Service to achieve uh, systematic change in management of blood pressure and cholesterol. And finally, our diabetes prevention program offers technical assistance and, tra and training to the tribes and to our urban Indian centers as well to assist them in implementing an adapted version of the NIH diabetes prevention program. That's a program that we've um, implemented successfully in Montana. We have 15 sites up and running. And right now, we are, um, we're also proud of some work to address a disparate group, and that's our Medicaid population. We've received a uh, Medicaid incentive grant, and through that grant, we're actually um, able to reimburse for this lifestyle intervention on a, um, on a pilot basis. So we're very proud of that work as well. In terms of um, cancer screening, since 1996, we've been providing breast and cervical cancer screening to um, low-income and uninsured women in Montana. Our outreach specifically to American Indian women has included um, our development of the Montana American Indian Women's Health Coalition. And it includes representatives from all of the tribes, and I think it really is a key to our success, having had those women help us develop the outreach to get women screened. We've now achieved um, almost 20% of all screenings are among 
American Indian women. And um, our most recent effort, we also are using that group to help guide our outreach, but we are now trying to move into colorectal um, screening and really trying to work with the American Indian population. This um, gives a view of the three major risk factors for poor pregnancy outcome. And you'll see that um, fully half of American Indian women enter prenatal care after the first trimester. Our teen pregnancy rates are, are very high among American Indian as compared to our white population, as is smoking and pregnancy. Um, looking at some interventions that we think we need to really promote to make a dent in this inequity, reducing teen pregnancy, especially through um, promoting access to highly effective contraceptives, and promoting delay in sexual activity, and then home visiting programs for high-risk families. We're working with two tribes to implement teen pregnancy and STI prevention curricula in middle schools and high schools, and this is through a fairly new grant, so we really can consider this to be new and pilot projects. Um, the curricula we're using are called Draw the Line and Respect the Line for middle schools and then reducing the risk for, um, for high school. And in addition to that, our Human and Community Service Division is providing grants to every tribe that support services for parenting teens. And we think these services are important not just in terms of supporting um, the current situation and providing much needed services, but also in terms of prevention and affecting outcomes of subsequent pregnancies. Uh, our outreach um, to American Indians through home visiting, we've provided funding to every tribe for um, development of community-specific home visiting programs. Right now, those communities are um, developing co community-based coalitions and really trying to connect the dots among all of the various service providers and, and create a system of home visiting in communities. Uh, and we expect that those programs will promote smoking cessation and early entry into prenatal care. And finally, um, looking at communicable disease in Montana, the reported incidence of chlamydia is higher among American Indian residents than whites, although we are very sure that part of the difference is due to aggressive screening among American Indian providers. Um, the overall incidence of gonorrhea, of course, is lower than chlamydia. However, American Indians have higher incidence rates than white Montanans. Um, the interventions that we um, promote are screening and early detection, of course, case investigation, contact tracing, and treatment, including partner-delivered patient therapy. And our work really has involved um, close work with tribal health departments and Indian Health Service units on screening, contact tracing, and treatment with the goals of preventing spread and, and serious long-term complications. In terms of childhood immunizations, our Vaccine for um, Children program provides um, free uh, vaccines. We um, have some good news here. Our tribal clinics actually have higher, in our clinic reviews, actually have higher up-to-date rates with 68% of children fully immunized compared to our statewide rate of 52%. So work to do all the way around, but the tribal clinics actually are doing better than the um, the clinic serving the general population. So finally, um, just some conclu conclusions here. American Indian residents obviously experience more barriers to improved health. Um, we think that our effective outreach activities have been those that have involved the community and have been community-based in terms of delivery and where we have tried to use proven effective interventions. We've had a lot of help from Anna over the last five years, um, a lot of leadership, and I think what she's taught us is that we are going to be most successful if this work isn't assigned to an Office of American Indian Health or an Office of Minority Health, 
um, but rather when it's integrated into the work of all of our programs and becomes everyone's responsibility. So that's kind of the, the situation in Montana and just a few highlights of what we're doing. Great. Well, Jane and Anna, thank you very much for your presentation. You've really brought to life the uh, data and research that Dr. Smedley was talking about, but really bringing it to life at the state and tribal level, uh, speaking about the challenges, as well as successful implementation on many of your programs, so, uh, which is quite encouraging. So next for our, our last speaker, we will now turn to uh, John Auerbach. And uh, John was appointed Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health in April 2007. Uh, under his uh, leadership, the department uh, developed new and innovative programs to address racial and ethnic disparities, to promote wellness, to combat chronic disease, and to support the successful implementation of the state's health care reform initiative. Prior to his appointment as commissioner, uh, John was the executive director of the Boston Public Health Commission for uh, almost a decade. In that role, he was noted for groundbreaking work toward the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities, implementing one of the nation's strongest tobacco control bans, and initiating citywide asthma, cardiovascular, and cancer programs. And finally, um, John has led the ASTO's uh, President's Challenge, uh, which was focused specifically on health equity. Uh, it took place in 2010 and 2011, obviously demonstrating a, a longstanding commitment to this issue. So with that, I will turn it over to John Albrecht, Commissioner, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Thanks very much, Terry. Um, I'm going to quickly go through sli the slides I have, and what I'm going to try to do is just highlight some suggestions for those of you who are on the call that are uh, wondering where to begin in terms of uh, making the economic case, uh, beginning to make or, or beginning to make uh, health promotion a priority within your department. We're all um, strapped for resources now, so I, I've tried to make some suggestions about uh, uh, activities that are relatively um, uh, easy to do even in difficult economic times. Next. I think we, we all should just be really prepared um, uh, to know the data uh, very well that reinforce the fact that health disparities exist. And the next few slides are just examples of that from Massachusetts. You can go through those pretty quickly. Uh, they just are the ones, uh, and next one, um, and, and third. And, and those are just every state. Um, has some version which illustrates the disparities. Um, it's, it's great if the, there's a special publication that uh, you can put out that pulls those out, focuses on them, and draws people's attention to them, and also just makes it part of the routine discussions within um, the departments about the very specific data. That begins to lay the groundwork for putting the other pieces together um, uh, of making the economic case. So having the data at your fingertips. Next. We, we make the case uh, in, in our state that um, working on um, the issue of health equity is really a data-driven approach. It's, n it's based upon our prioritizing those areas where we know there's an unfair um, or a heavier burden of disease and premature death. And so we need to look at all areas where that may exist. Next. And so in addition to looking um, at um, the areas of uh, race and ethnicity where we know the data are clear, we've also identified that there are other variables we should be mindful of. This, this is a chart that just illustrates um, how education uh, educational levels uh, sometimes also relate to healthcare disparities. Next. And this chart uh, illustrates uh, people with disabilities are at greater risk for a variety of different health factors um, not directly related to their disability. Uh, and there are other populations as well, GOBT populations, um, for example, where we've seen a pattern of, um, of uh, issues related to disparities. Let's see. Next. So next, please. So, so then I would say the next um, step in terms of making the economic argument is really taking a bit of a look at what's behind uh, some of those disparities um, and, and trying to find local data to do that when possible. Uh, this was uh, an indication that, that poverty 
uh, is often strongly correlated with certain health indicators. This uh, found, for example, the, our analysis of people with diabetes in Massachusetts is that uh, uh, people who were poor in Massachusetts were more than three times as likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. Next. And then uh, we, we found this correlate also with education. This often is confounding and making even more intense the disparities associated with race and ethnicity. Next. And then we, we try to gather very specific community-based examples of the kind of place-based factors that Dr. Smedley was referring to, um, doing sometimes many um, uh, um, studies that look at um, where fast food restaurants are, where stores that sell fresh fruits and vegetables are located so that we can draw on specific and concrete local examples. Um, there also are um, other types of groups, including planning organizations and economic organizations that sometimes gather data that are relevant to our drawing into our health analysis. Next. One area that often I think is overlooked are, uh, involves data uh, regarding um, uh, employment statistics. And we've worked well with our occupational um, health uh, and surveillance team at our department to try to identify areas where wor there are work-related disparities um, that exist. I, I think that's sometimes overlooked, but it's very much related to uh, looking at the social determinants of health. And this is just one indication where uh, this, this particular chart of where we saw uh, greater, much greater fatalities that were work-related among Latinos in the state. Next. And then, of course, we shouldn't lose track of the fact that uh, their uh, access to health care makes a difference, too. And um, this is, uh, these are national statistics which just illustrate that there's a much higher percentage of people who are uninsured uh, among the uh, black, uh, Hispanic, and Asian populations. They're the ones indicated here. Next. Whenever possible, it's good for us to gather information that illustrates that discrimination itself is a factor in people's lives. There's a gro growing body of uh, of uh, written material and published material, including uh, the article that's um, listed in this slide, which um, makes the case that there um, is um, w we can demonstrate a relationship between discrimination-related stress in people's life and physiological differences that lead to uh, a variety of different health factors. We also know that some specific injuries are related to discrimination, such as violence, and that certain um, behaviors that are coping mechanisms in response to discrimination uh, can also create health problems uh, such as um, uh, tobacco use or substance use. So wherever possible, factoring in the impact of discrimination is good. So the next few slides just illustrate what can, where to begin where, where you, in addition to gathering this data. Next. Next. You know, I, I think our departments don't often reflect the diversity of the race and ethnicity of the populations that we serve uh, clearly here in Montana, what the changes that have been made there and how that has been a big factor in, um, uh, in uh, crafting policies that are effective. Um, so whenever possible, um, having diverse leadership in our departments that reflect the diversity and diverse leadership at all levels and not just in um, some specific areas that uh, focus on um, um, say, racial and ethnic disparities. Next. Um, and, and then just simply speaking out on it, uh, uh, speaking out on the issue I think is critical in uh, using the bully pulpit where possible. Uh, many departments, including our own, have set up uh, offices of health equity at, the, at high levels so that they can help to influence policy and not be pigeonholed in certain um, but particular segments of the department. Next. One of the easiest things to do is, though, uh, is to publish a, a quick study um, uh, using data you already have on disparities and just pulling it out. This has been helpful in our state and other states I know for um, drawing the attention of the uh, policymakers. Next. Um, and that, this is just another example of where we've, we've developed that kind of approach. Next. 
Um, the federal class standards, the culturally and linguistically appropriate standards, um, are, are definitely something we can take advantage of. We've now incorporated a requirement around class standards in all of our contracts, and that's helping to ensure that services are provided in a more uh, appropriate manner. Next. The next um, slide focuses on, um, whenever possible, providing specialized funding. That's more difficult. Um, there are some great examples where uh, funding has recently become available, for example, uh, in, in those areas where community transformation grants have been received. Those allow a real focus on um, the social determinants of health, the conditions in people's lives, and trying to alter those conditions so that they're less likely to um, uh, contribute to the health risks that people face. But the notion of health in all policies also does mean that whenever possible, I think we should be uh, thinking about training our staff or freeing them up so that they can work um, in other sectors, whether those sectors be uh, attending meetings on transportation planning, working with the school department, sometimes even uh, uh, economic development, uh, in order to try to um, have a, uh, an impact on policy development as it occurs in those other sectors. Uh, not easy to do, but, but part of um, uh, what the challenge is if we're going to uh, recognize that uh, community uh, uh, factors and work factors and school, what happens in schools all contributes to people's health. It's important as a way of uh, shifting our attention. Next. Uh, just other inexpensive things to do are local screenings of such things as unnatural causes. Uh, those can be done uh, quickly and quietly, uh, quickly and uh, inexpensively in, in community settings. Next. And from a cost-effective perspective, we are now uh, challenging our program people to only do um, media campaigns that really target the, the populations that are at highest risk for the different um, uh, health concerns. Uh, we, we have found that it hasn't been cost-effective to do population-wide campaigns when what we're really trying to do is reach the populations that are at greatest risk within that larger general population. And so we've We've um, increasingly moved away from general population campaigns to ones that are specifically uh, crafted to reach a certain population in terms of language, cultural, image, et cetera. Next. Um, and, and, you know, we, there, regardless of what happens with the Supreme Court's decision around the Affordable Care Act, I think we're all going to be seeing many more experiences to uh, um, where insurance uh, opportunities may occur. And in terms of efforts around expanding insurance opportunities, that's an area where we can either see greater disparity result if, um, or, or, or we can close the gaps. Um, we're, we're happy. We, we've seen in Massachusetts that we've closed, as you can see from this chart, we've significantly closed the gap between those who are insured and uninsured uh, among the white and the black population, where previously the black population was significantly more likely to be uninsured. However, we haven't closed it with regard to the Latino population. Um, their uninsured rate has gone down, but the gap still exists. So that's an example where we, we want to continue to focus some specific targeted attention with the Department of Public Health's involvement on uh, doing outreach to Latino populations, determining what are the factors that contribute to the continuing gap and then helping to close those. And then finally, all of these different factors um, uh, come together to, to take the kind of presentation that Dr. Smedley presented as the broader uh, uh, philosophical perspective for us to embrace, but allowing us to uh, uh, adapt those uh, arguments so that they reflect the specific conditions in our own communities, and we can make sure that we're making those arguments in concrete and specific ways that resonate with our residents as well as our policymakers. Thanks. Great. John, thank you very much for that presentation, for the several examples demonstrating the importance of collecting data and understanding the data that we have and using the data to make the case as well as several examples of programs, concrete strategies, and targeted specific um, interventions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your uh, thoughtful presentations, all of our presenters today on this very important topic. And now I'd like to open up the floor for questions, uh, for discussion with our speakers. 
Uh, operator, uh, would you please uh, deliver instructions for us? Certainly, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. And if your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. Once again, to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4. And one moment, please, for our first question. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register for a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4. So just while we're... We have a question on the line, sir. Just one moment, please. Okay, great. And our first question comes from the line of George. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and um, I think we've got really good data that shows the health disparities and the health inequities, but we don't have a really good way to tie uh, those health outcomes to dollar amounts to try to describe at a local level what the economic costs are or what the economic losses are or the economic consequences. I'm just looking for a little bit of guidance on how we could, is, is there some kind of a formula we could use or where could I look for more resources to try to tell the economic story locally? So we'll turn that over to our presenters. If any of you would like to address the question in New Mexico. Um, well, hi. Um, this is John. Um, the, you know, I, well, one way that we've uh, approached that is what, what we try to, um, whenever possible, take advantage of our uh, Medicaid data. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, when we've looked at, um, we've looked at the cost of um, treating uh, a person with full-blown diabetes for a year. Uh, and then when we've, uh, so we, ca we utilize that dollar amount um, and then um, uh, look at the gap in terms of uh, the disproportionate number of uh, cases of diabetes in, say, the black community, we can uh, quantify those cases and then try to uh, project out the uh, added expenses related to uh, the number of cases uh, that exist because of the gap. And if the gap was closed, how many fewer cases there would be. It's just one example. It's a crude, it's a crude way of doing it, but it, but it does illustrate that there um, are specific costs associated with the specific illnesses where the uh, disparities are, are uh, particularly notable. And Dr. Smedley, is there anything you'd like to add to that, given some of the similarities? No, I think that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, so uh, greetings, George, to you and the folks out there. I think also, um, you know, we, we do, uh, obviously everybody on the call understands the need for quantitative data, but I also think it's important not to overlook qualitative or even anecdotal uh, stories. Uh, these can be powerful from, for example, a small business uh, owner who um, has high rates of absenteeism due to, uh, you know, health inequities, uh, or families themselves that are hurt by uh, the, uh, the, the poor health of a breadwinner. So I, I would add that in addition to the great suggestion that John offered that sometimes uh, the powerful uh, stories or examples can be helpful as well. Operator, other questions? We do indeed have another question, sir. Our next question comes from the line of LaQuanta. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you all. My name is LaQuanta Smalley, and I'm calling from Maryland. Um, I have a question for the panel. Um, thank you, Ms. Sorrell, Anna, for um, pretty much being a cultural broker for the Indian population in your state. But I'm just curious how others or how do you all in, in Montana and Massachusetts incorporate cultural brokers or community health workers to help facilitate the work that you do um, for your state and or to bring back feedback 
from, you know, your consumers, of course, for quality improvement efforts to improve health equity situations in your state. Um, so this is Anna, and um, I, I thank you for your, 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 your kind words. You know, in, when you're dealing with tribes, the most important thing that you can do is understand who in the community is the gatekeeper. And those gatekeepers are very different in different programs. And, you know, so you can't just say, well, if you go to community health reps or the tribal health director, they'll get you the information. You really have to have your feet on the ground um, and spending time there. You know, I, I, um, because Montana is a very, very big state, uh, sometimes we'll fly in and spend two hours and then fly out. When you go and spend three days, you get enough information and people will share things with you that you would never get if you made five trips at two hours a day or two hours a time. Um, and, and I think that that's really important when you're, when you're, when you're working with a community that, that has very unique cultural differences, uh, different languages, different types of governments, and so getting to understand who are the gatekeepers and building a relationship with them. This is John. I, I would, um, I, I think that's a great, that Anna's suggestions, uh, observations are really excellent. I, I also would, um, I appreciate the, the question, uh, the question mentioning uh, community health workers because we really have seen that community health workers where the, the health workers represent the communities we're trying to reach can be critical um, uh, brokers and and leaders in terms of having an impact on health. Um, the, the dilemma that we found over time is that they're, they're, um, community health workers tend to be grant funded and so it's, um, it's difficult for us to have um, uh, enough of them to do the kind of work that's necessary and, and often they're grant funded with a categorical or disease specific approach when a, a broader approach to the health of the population that the community health worker is involved in would be, a, would be preferable. So we're, we're taking some steps in our state to see if we can um, expand opportunities to actually make community health workers a part of the reimbursement system um, as we move to away from fee-for-service to more global payments and uh, anticipating accountable care organization approaches. We are encouraging um, providers to think about the common uh, and uh, regular use of community health workers and we're creating a statewide board of registration for community health workers with specific curricula and training so that we can guarantee that when, pe when they're hired there's a, a level of training and, um, and um, uh, professional knowledge that will be useful and, and we think that expanding, uh, expanding their availability and usage um, as uh, members of the the public health and clinical teams will help to uh, overcome some of the um, cultural barriers that uh, the, the questioner was mentioning. Thank you. Thank you, John. Other questions? Our next question comes from the line of Gail. Please go ahead. Um, you, this question is, my question is for um, each of the panel members, but in particular uh, Dr. Smedley. You gave a great example of the housing and urban development um, moving to opportunity demonstration program. And I'm wondering if there are some other really long-term um, health outcomes when an intervention has addressed at least one or more social and economic factors. Uh, thank you for that question. That's a, a great question. Um, you know, in, in talking about um, potential intervention strategies like moving to opportunity or other housing mobility strategies, I think it's important that we contextualize it, that these strategies in and of themselves are not likely, um, in my view, to be particularly effective unless they're also accompanied by other uh, comprehensive uh, investments. So, um, in general, we call for two uh, broad categories of, of interventions to, to, to address uh, segregation and high levels of poverty concentration and their effects on health and human development. One are people-based strategies, in other words, housing mobility strategies to help those who uh, would like to move out of communities that are, that are suffering from disinvestment. 
But we think that it has to be accompanied at the same time by place-based in investments, the kinds of examples that I provided earlier. Uh, for example, strategies to attract uh, vendors selling healthy foods into food deserts, uh, efforts to reduce environmental degradation uh, in communities of color, uh, efforts to improve um, the quality of housing and transportation, efforts to um, improve access to uh, spaces for recreation and play. All of these strategies should be employed uh, simultaneously as part of a comprehensive multi-pronged strategy. Uh, the challenge, of course, uh, is in assessing the return on investment, uh, but we think that that return is likely to be much stronger when uh, we realize that the potential synergistic effects of all of these strategies uh, being uh, imp implemented uh, uh, simultaneously. The other reason, of course, to uh, look comprehensively and not just to focus on housing mobility is that um, you know, many metropolitan communities are seeing significant demographic shifts. Uh, some communities are experiencing significant gentrification, uh, while other uh, communities are, are uh, experiencing uh, a growing uh, concentration of poverty. Uh, so uh, in order to ensure uh, that we don't uh, inadvertently advantage some and disadvantage others, we think it's important to employ both people-based and place-based strategies at the same time. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Additional questions? And our next question on the line comes from the line of Amy. Please go ahead. Yes, my name is Jamie, and I work on a five-year grant um, on a diabetes grant. And my question is, as part of our grant, we are to work um, with the state diabetes prevention and control programs. What is the best way to facilitate or establish the relationships between the state health departments and the native communities within their state? Anna or John? Turn that one to you. Um, this is Anna, and, and what I would recommend is, is that you go there and, and you take time to figure out what are the cultural, um, uh, what are the cultural protocols of that particular community, and then you honor them, but you really, really have to spend the time with your feet on the ground. John or Jane, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I, I, I think Anna, Anna's experience really uh, is, she's the expert in terms of building those ties, and I think that uh, her guidance is, uh, is, sound, is the best. Right on the money. Right. Additional questions? As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the four. I'm thinking we might have time for one or two more questions, and then we'll need to close out respect for, out of respect for people's time. Certainly, sir. We do indeed have a question on the line. One moment, please. Okay. And our next question comes from the line of Candace. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, this is Candace. My question is um, I'd like to... I'm sorry, I'd like to start by thanking everyone for their presentation and then ask as a person who's coming up in the health disparities field and looking forward in terms of training, there seems to be a lot of kind of interdisciplinarity happening in the field, and I wanted to get everyone's kind of um, advice on how individuals should train in terms of whether it be formal education or informal opportunities like webinars going forward in health disparities work. Great question. Uh, panelists? Well, this is Brian. I would just uh, say that you're, um, thank you for your excellent observation. Uh, the field is definitely moving toward uh, interdisciplinary and cross-sector collaboration. This is critically important. And uh, I know in the work that we do here at the Joint Center, cross-sector collaboration we see as being critical. It's uh, sort of step one. Uh, in advancing uh, community-based equity work. Um, I would say that both formal as well as any informal training opportunities are important, but um, it may be that there's no better training than actually getting on the ground and rolling up your sleeves with uh, communities. Um, and uh, 
So, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't suggest any particular interdisciplinary training program, but I just think that there, there are many opportunities, both formal and informal, and particularly opportunities to learn from and work directly with communities. Um, you know, the major initiative that we run here at the Joint Center, Place Matters, uh, that's the you know, core to the work that we do. Uh, and um, would encourage you, you could visit our website at www.jointcenter.org or, or others. I'm sure ASTHO has um, uh, pertinent information as well, as well as uh, NATO has some excellent uh, resources for uh, learning about and training. In fact, I think the NATO Health Equity uh, training curriculum is, is excellent, and you might want to look at that as well. So, thank you, Dr. Smedley. And Candace, I think I will use your question and, and that answer to actually close us out by saying thank you for your interest in this field. And I think what we're, what we're seeing, uh, and certainly is clear from the presentations, uh, that there will be, there needs to be, there has to be incredible growth in this area in our understanding and implementation of programs to uh, eliminate health uh, inequality in our country. And as we heard from Dr. Smedley's report, uh, well, we must bend the health curve, uh, health care cost curve in our country. Uh, it's not sustainable as it is. And in fact, our economic growth is uh, entirely dependent on our ability to do that when you look at the numbers associated with lost productivity. Uh, we have several examples of programs that make a difference from Jane and Anna and John and Often we get that question that John posed, which is, where do we begin? There are many, many places where we can begin, sometimes in small steps, but know that big steps will be necessary to close the gaps that exist today. I would like to close out by thanking the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, ASTO, uh, who's working very closely with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, as well as the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, uh, all three of those entities working together to make this webinar uh, possible today. If you have any questions or we have other people on the line who are not able to ask their question, uh, I would encourage you to contact Mino Mishra, uh, spelled M-E-E-N-O-O, -O, uh, Mishra, M-I-S-H-R-A, who is a senior analyst of health equity at ASTO. You can go to the ASTO website. Uh, and contact her through that website. If you have any questions, we'll do our best to get an answer to you and appreciate everyone's interest in, in being on the webinar today. And with that, we will uh, close out our webinar. Thank you very much for your participation today. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line. <laughs>